uh, <clears throat> uh, that number number uh, two is this inner reality, the personality that's in touch with surprising psychic forces, with the unconscious, with myth, with spirituality, um, with his, and also with the shadow, with I shouldn't say the shadow, with the, with his shadow, with those uh, dimensions of his life that are um, uh, uh, unintegratable. The parts of his personality, usually it's parts that we are embarrassed about, we can't integrate, we're ashamed of, we deny and repress, and then they, of course, because they're only in the con unconscious and not in the conscious, they come around the back and they whip us from behind. That uh, patches us. Yeah, um, Chris. Yes? Alex, um, you said unintegratable. Yeah, but unintegratable. That we can't handle, say, our fears, our, um, it's usually fear, but it's also, um, our uh, irrational dimensions that lead us to do what we're doing, and we couldn't ever admit that. I mean, it's not the whole of the unconscious, but it is an important part of the unconscious. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm just, I'm still questioning whether it's unintegratable. It is, un <clears throat> as soon as it's integrated, it's not shadow anymore. Gotcha. So I remember when I came here for an interview, practically the first question when I met with the faculty was, uh, can you tell us about your shadow? Because this is a school that had lots of shadow elements. Not to say it was overrun by shadow. Uh, we didn't know it was. Uh, and I'm really glad that I said, well, of course not. If I could tell you, it wouldn't be your shadow. So then they said, okay, he's not as bad as I thought, even though he's from New York. Uh, <laughs> This is, as soon as it comes up here, it's not shadow, but there's still plenty down there. Plenty, plenty, plenty. And we keep it down there. We only let stuff up that we can afford to let up, right? So I sometimes, if, sometimes if I'm involved in a conversation about Steiner and, a, and a, a, a beginning person, or maybe not a beginning person, uh, will say, um, I, I don't know, you know, uh, uh, if, if I could go with this, I don't know if I want to, you know, go that far, that far, you know, because it is pretty far. And I said, don't worry, you won't. You won't, because you, your, your rational will block anything that's going to cause you more trouble than you want. You'll keep it where it is. And all those embarrassing things will keep those where they are. We're not going to let them up until somehow, someday, we're forced by a, like that. I mean, just smack in the face. And then somebody, maybe a therapist, uh, or a lover, or a child, or an aged person, or somebody who has a little distance, will say, psst, would you look at this? <laughs> yeah. Sometimes the universe does that for us. Sometimes it's a person. But we will do everything possible to keep that way it is. And one of the things that yoga is really, really good at is persisting, all right? Also with himself, well, I should say not also, foremost with himself. He was very ruthless with himself, which doesn't mean he was perfect. But he did work at being honest about what he had in his unconscious. Right? That's my opinion, anyway. All right, now, going further back, we are dealing with a person who is deep, his psyche is deeply uh, he's Swiss, but he's deeply Germanic, German culture. He comes out of uh, Goethe and out of Nietzsche. And he is, if he had been a Lutheran pastor, he would have been the fifth generation Lutheran pastor. This is big lineage. Not that it's so impressive, it's that it's so singular, all right? So it comes, it's not Roman Catholic, it's not Asian or uh, North American, it is Central European Protestant. So it has to do with individuality, it has to do with a struggle between the human and the divine, it has to do with uh, a lot of violence, 
a lot of self-deception about the violence. Uh, it has to do with the, rec the presumed requirement of faith despite the fairly widespread denied lack of faith. Did you get that? Widespread denial about the faith that was like a little candle going out. All right. So Jung comes after Nietzsche, his two big seminars that produced two enormous volumes on Nietzsche, very Nietzschean. He, um, he comes out, he comes after, and this is very important that he comes after Nietzsche's madman going into the square with a lantern saying, God is dead. And I think I mentioned this to you once before. Did I? You're, not look, you're looking as though I didn't. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I will now. Um, I was giving a lecture somewhere and I mentioned it. Um, not that I don't mention it every day, but there are times when it's really relevant that the old, Nietzsche's old man goes into the square. There's only about three or four pages. And um, there are people a bunch of men standing nearby and says, what's wrong, old man? Have you lost your way? <laughs> and he says, no, I haven't lost my way, but he said, what are you looking for? And he says, well, I'm looking for God, but I know I won't find him. And I, this may not be the exact words that I just said, but this is exact. Namely, God is dead and we have killed him. That's the important line. God is dead and we have killed him. So what, what Nietzsche, who is this kind of unbounded, uh, prophetic, searching, brilliant, tormented soul. All those words are important. Brilliant? Absolutely brilliant. I mean, he was a full professor at 24 in the uh, University of Basel. It's not supposed to happen. Uh, at, so brilliant we got. But also um, tormented by Either the, re either the loss of faith of the culture, or his own loss of faith, or both, or the relationship, the tormented relationship between him and his culture. Now there is also some subplots about him and um, Lou Salome, and you know, who's a, a woman who was um, um, romantically connected to, uh, if you're ready for this, Rilke and Freud and Nietzsche. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Stay tuned. You'll probably get a lot of that if you take the uh, the Rilke course. Right? I haven't read that book, but it'll be good. Yeah, Ken. What, what was the significance of the square? Sorry. No, the square. So the old man goes in and said, "God is dead." All right. And he said, "And we have killed him." That becomes for many people, certainly the European intellectual elite, that becomes the the signature of the time. Mm -hmm. This is the time when, as a result of the 19th century, it is now clear that God is no longer a viable concept. God really is, not that God exists and is inaccessible, but that God is mean, the concept has lost its meaning. But you mean like a town square or like a square square? Is it a metaphorical square? No, no, well, the, it's all metaphorical because it's a, it's a person in a little essay that Nietzsche wrote. But it's real in terms of the way it's presented that it's a, it's a fictional situation that is, but the fiction is the instrument of what is taken to be the, um, the final description of the psyche of the century. That what began with Descartes and Newton is now final. That the God who was doubted, who was sort of um, dealt with, sort of not dealt with, sort of avoided, sort of paid little tribute here and there. Now it's clear. God is dead. Oh, and anybody who's looking, I'm sorry, any, looking for God won't find them. And anybody who thinks that he or she has found God <coughs> is in self-deception. Mm -hmm. This goes right into the whole of existentialism, whereby if you're looking for God as comfort, you are uh, in bad faith, using the language of Jean Paul Sartre. Okay? No, I was just wondering because Jung you know, talks about the quaternary and the mandala and the four, you know, all sort of symbolizing some kind of structure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was just 
I don't know if that the mandala is one of his ways of helping Western humanity get centered again after basically the decimation at the end of the 19th century. So you, I want you to take seriously, as a cultural psychic experience, the death of God is an actual event. That is to say, at, at the level of people who read, read books and who thought big thoughts, the death of God became a cultural psychic fact. Right? It was an event that you couldn't uh, pretend with, uh, did not happen without self-deception and, and sort of uh, uh, pretense driven by fear. All right, yeah, uh, Emerson? But, but Nietzsche is not a nihilist, as he's often sort of maybe misinterpreted to be, right? Because he just doesn't, he doesn't end there. He keeps going, right? Nietzsche is a Rorschach. That you can find in Nietzsche this fabulous spiritual seeker, and you can find him being quite ruthless in his critique and despondency. Uh, he, I think of him as a spiritual seeker, but one who, I think, I think I'm right to say, came up empty. What about the Ubermensch? The Ubermensch, this ob Oberman, or um, uh, sometimes called Superman, I think Oberman is better, um, is uh, a conviction of Nietzsche's about what is needed but it's not clear that there is an Ubermensch. Mm -hmm. He himself thinks of himself as an Ubermensch, but he is an overman who, in a certain sense, only has his railing and not, I believe, any, um, any problem for us. That he, in other words, he, can't, he doesn't really help us that much except by clearing the text. So he's a great, um, he's a great leveler and basically says, now on, it's slavery, which is what every, almost everybody is, or there is the possibility and the necessity, but not necessarily the reality, all right? Possibility, necessity, but not necessarily the reality of another kind of humanity in which I would say for which he hopes but I don't think but see he has already beheaded <laughs> Socrates and Jesus so philosophy and Christianity are both for slave morality and so there's no two you, it's really Zarathustra who is the possibility we don't have a Zarathustra, except maybe Nietzsche. Except when we look to Nietzsche, he's not giving us little maxims to help us get through the day. <clears throat> he's not. Maybe you say, well, well, I don't want little maxims. I want to be a Ubermensch. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's good. Uh, I, I, uh, I encourage you, but I don't think I'm going to contribute. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard because you have to take on the whole. Okay, here's what it is. You'd have to take on. What he says is the mendacity at the core of the culture. Right? In other words, the whole culture is built on lies about meaning, which there isn't. All right? That's, the, that's this mendacity. And the whole of existentialism comes, and most drama, most drama comes from uh, this. So there is, there is crucifixion, but no resurrection. There is Dionysian, but not very much Apollonian. It's tough. This is, this is really tough stuff. And Jung has, is an is a heir and descendant of, of Nietzsche. He's an heir descendant of other people too. But this is a very big line that I'd like you to keep track of. All right? Uh, and his, his analyses of, of our individual integrity and the integrity of the culture is quite fierce and 
I think particularly confident because it is reinforced by his um, psychological practice. The people who come to him are people you know, with a big problem. This is, you know, police tend to see criminals and psychologists tend to see people who have psychological problems. And um, so uh, he saw a lot of people who were really stuck and became brilliant about stuckness. Uh, and so that's, okay. Now, um, we're getting back to him. So he has these two personalities which he's aware of early on, and maybe when we're having a conversation, you could, some of you might want to say something about what that is, if you have had that experience. Um, I know many people who, who deal with that big time. They've got a career uh, where it's just like that, doctor, lawyer, whatever, and then this other side may or may not be fed, but where there's a big hunger for the artistic, the spiritual, the romantic, the, the mysterious, the, the noumenal, the noumenal, the, the irreducible, mysterious dimension. You know, I know that's there. If I had a weekend, if I weren't in this 60 hour job, I didn't have two kids, if I didn't, if I weren't so scared of letting anybody know what I really think or what I really want, et cetera, et cetera, then they go on without feeding that, feeding, feeding, feeding. All right, one of the things about PCC is we're supposed to bring those together. So the language for that is with, and I think we're probably trying to, I mean, I think we are working on this, bringing together the enlightenment, the 18th century, with the reaction, the 19th century. All right, they're both really important. <clears throat> and anybody, if you're really, really romantic, um, think about what it would be like not to have had the Enlightenment, where there's no attempt at universal human rights, no attempt at objectivity, rationality, um, creating, not just enduring, but creating a sane society. All that comes with the Enlightenment. Okay, uh, which fortunately was just in time for the um, six people who created um, the United States. Not that we've been rational since, but in that shiny moment, it was pretty good. It was pretty good. It was really good to read those guys. It's just like, wow, were well, they good. OK, uh, we can talk about that. Um, so now, um, so he was into uh, medicine. And but of course, he's always got his eye on this, uh, this un, um, uncultivated uh, personality, too. And he does these association experiments, and all of which, of course, can be written in a, 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 a referee journal coming out of uh, the, the hospital, the Gozi uh, hospital where, where he was working. Uh, but uh, it all, everything had to be sort of legitimate psychiatry and not, you know, his funny stuff coming to, you know, study uh, the Navajo or going uh, to Kenya or someplace to study myths and dreams. That comes, I keep, he keeps that uh, to the side. Okay, so he says, um, trying to keep track of what I'm saying so that I don't leave out anything important. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, yeah, he's, when he's talking about, this is in the introduction, this was all dictated, by the way, when he was 81, um, to uh, Anila Yaffe. Uh, uh, he was surrounded by these amazing women. Four, five, six, <laughs> really amazing. Uh, psychologists, scholars, um, you know, quite very, very impressive. I'm trying to think of as even a single male. Michael Fordham, I guess. Eric Neumann, who then left there and went to Israel and wrote a great book on the, on the, um, the mother and the infant. Um, but mostly it's these, it's these women. Um, so he, sa he says in this opening chapter on, he says, now I'm going to reveal my, my myth at the end of my life. He's um, I think 81. Um, and it's the interest of the year, it was last year. Uh, he says, the chapters only fleetingly illuminate the outward events 
uh, she writes, the uh, outward events of Jung's life in recompense, they transmit the atmosphere of his intellectual world and the experience of a man to whom the psyche was a profound reality. So I'm going to try to give you a sense of psyche and why he thinks it includes everything and what does that mean, all right? Only the spiritual essence of his life, of his life's experience remained in his memory. And this alone seemed to him worth the effort of telling. So quite incredibly, he, this is a what, 400 page book, and I think there's only one reference to his wife, Emma, who made his entire career possible, because she was a member of the richest family in Switzerland. Um, and uh, there's only one reference, and it was what she gave, she thought he should do something, uh, and uh, he did the opposite, and it turned out to be right, so she was wrong. So I mean, I'm the editor, I would have asked him to rethink that. Uh, but it's, there are very few people in it, and it's all about his, his inner life. It's very much, Aurobindo said to more than one biographer, my life is not on the surface to see. Hmm. We could talk about this, about whether that kind of division is, um, uh, true, I'm going to say that. Um, then he says, I find that all my thoughts circle around God like the planets around the sun and are as irresistibly attracted by him that all my thoughts are about God as the sun and I'm just drawn into that, that, that uh, image. That image? Symbol. Symbol. Um, Okay, it was eight, so I'm wrong. It wasn't his 81st, it's his 83rd year that he set out this, tell the story. Uh, I can understand myself only in the light of inner happenings. It is these that make up, it is these that make up the singularity of my life, and with these my autobiography deals. So it's only with the myths and images and symbols that he dealt with. Okay, so uh, then, then in the book, it goes to personality number one, personality number two, and he says in personality uh, number two, he was beginning to track involuntarily uh, images and myths and particularly dreams, he said, some of which were from his own family lineage, his own uh, uh, you know, bio biological family inheritance, and he says some of which came from other cultures, totally unrelated to him. This, I think, is very important, if it's, and I assume it's true, is that there are just kind of free-floating images and myths that kind of land. And I, don't, and I don't even know for sure if there's a logic to the landing. But um, he's very clear that that happens. So that's pretty interesting. OK, um, that's one and two. Um, now I want to do a little bit with Freud. Is it a system? This is so great. In the Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, it's a really good chapter. Now, it's only Jung's version. So you have to go to the letters, which I actually have read. Big volume called the Jung, Freud Jung, or Jung Freud? It's published by the Jung people. But all the letters are there between the two of them. Um, it, I think, I read it. Six or eight years? Six or eight, I'm forgetting this minute, but short. And uh, so there's Jung in Switzerland uh, in this sort of quintessential uh, uh, Christian or somewhat Christian, somehow in that line, all right, uh, a half a generation younger than Freud, living in fiercely anti-Semitic uh, Austria, Vienna, lots of books about the depth of Austrian uh, anti-Semitism. Um, there's one that I read a long time ago on Wittgenstein's Vienna. A little chilling. Um, and Freud had these experiences of anti-Semitism where his, you know, he'd be with his father and somebody would knock his father's hat off or force the father into the street or you know, call him names and etc. Freud grew up with this tremendous complexity about um, uh, anti-Semitism. 
and but the brilliance was uncontainable. He then um, uh, really does uh, discover for the first time in uh, or create for the first time in the West a science of the unconscious, not just beautiful writing. I mean, you know, Augustine wrote about the unconscious. And so did, first of all, every great literary figure, I mean, Shakespeare's, I, all, the, all the tragedies have these things going on at two different levels of where they're deceiving themselves and pretending this is not happening all the time. Guess what? It's happening. Uh, oh, I mean, Shakespeare's a genius of, of, uh, of psycho psychological of, of portrait of the conscious and the unconscious. But Freud then sets out to do a science of it. And it's, it's very amazing how he shows how we're lying and how we're stuck and how we have these images from our childhood that are stuck there somewhere and preventing us from going forward with a, with a love affair, with a marriage, uh, with a job, with uh, writing our, uh, something we're trying to write, or we want to be a painter and we can't because like that, and it has to do with what happened to us the first time we tried to paint. And all that is in there. And he says that he takes dream after dream after dream and association to try to get it out and finally we can see. So that's really what happened, right? I saw the I saw the I saw the dog eat from the you know, bowl, and then the person ate, and then oh my God, that's in my head. <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> I, actually, I don't think I remember that. But then I almost do. Okay. So that, that would come out in a dream, and then, well, what do you mean by that? Well, what did you actually say? <laughs> so it's great to read this um, uh, you know, for Freud's actual writings. He's a great, I mean, a Nobel Prize for literature because he's such a, a great writer. And the, the, the best one is the uh, in, uh, introduction, to, introduction to Psychoanalysis. Beautiful little book. But, I mean, if you've never, ever contacted Freud, yeah, I think you really owe it to yourself. I mean, Marx and Freud are the two most important figures of the 19th century by far. Actually, Freud's more 20th century than me, sorry. Excuse me. Um, Mark Darwin and Marx in the 19th century. Freud at the beginning of the 20th century. And those three are um, uh, amazing. Now, uh, um, Jacques Fazon's book is Darwin, Marx, not Darwin, Marx. Get a chance. Look up bars and B A R Z U N. It's it's. I can remember the doll, and I think I can, and I can remember the Freud. Then there's another book that has Berlioz. Getting them confused. There may be two books. Anyway, um, please read something really great about Freud or read Freud, because and reading him is great. It's not as though you know you wish you could get a secondary source. It's, it really isn't anything better than than reading Freud. It's the lengthy. That prose is really beautiful, much better, I would say, than, than Jung. It's going to be pretty complicated. I mean, Jung sometimes gives us great lines, really beautiful, crystal, lapidary lines, but some of it is. Uh, okay, so uh, they have this correspondence about um, uh, dream analysis and symbols, and mostly dream analysis, and neuroses, psychosis, etc. And then, um, uh, uh, so the, then the younger, uh, uh, physically very powerful and imposing, somewhat Christian uh, psychiatrist goes to visit the older, um, somewhat tortured, um, uh, Jewish, but anti-Jewish, uh, uh, certainly anti-Judaism, -Ju uh, older figure, uh, very determined to establish sex as the primer, as the key to unlock neuroses, right? The Oedipal complex and uh, almost everything, he, he calls it, in fact, at one point, he calls it his dogma. He says, he says to, he writes to Jung, don't betray my dogma, which is the sexual interpretation of, uh, of uh, neuro neurosis. And, uh, and Freud, of course, I forget if Freud writes to him, if Jung then writes to himself, or says to himself, or writes to Freud, I'm forgetting that, but he says, remember what he says, he says, that's exactly the problem, <laughs> that it's a dogma. We can't have dogmas. We can only have 
exploration, scientific research, studying, re really research, that's the key. Now, um, Freud was a great researcher and a great pioneer and courageous in getting beat up. And he's, in a, he's a Jew in a Christian culture and he's saying that basically everything has to do with, with sex. I mean, just buying, not a good place to be. His courage is fabulous, the fact, courage and, and uh, uh, genius. But it is true that he had his own unconscious elements having to do uh, with, a, uh, um, you know, this sort of up against the, the Christian, uh, Christian power and, and prejudice. Uh, and uh, also then, uh, you know, as a looking for a, uh, a Christian or sort of Christian successor. So this is now his son. Jung becomes Freud, Freud the son. But son is exactly what Jung is not willing to be of anybody. And he also, Jung, I didn't mention that, but Jung, um, uh, in his autobiography, talks about his sadness when he discovers that his father, who is a Lutheran pastor, just does not believe. I think that must be a very hard life to have, be a, a, um, have a religious responsibility when you no longer, when the religion is no longer feeding. That would be very hard. Steiner says when he was an altar boy, he could see the disbelief in the priests. Mm -hmm. And it made him just very, very sad. And then he stopped being an altar boy for that reason. Um, I don't quite know how people see that, but um, Jung certainly saw it with his father because of conversation. And the father would end any inquiry that came from Jung, probably as a teenager. You can see that. You know, oh, don't be a wise guy, <laughs> something like that. Uh, you don't need to know that, because uh, it says so. That's why, because it says so. You can hear all those answers. OK, so that's like that. So Freud needed a son. Jung was uh, absolutely not going to be anybody's son. Freud had a dogma. Uh, Jung was devoting his whole life to getting rid of dogmas and do uh, real um, uh, research. Um, and But anyway, they meet, and they talk for 13 hours. And it's this really just this you know, mountaintop to mountaintop conversation, as can happen once in a while. These two fabulously brilliant people really got a chance to them. You ever get with somebody who's really, really smart that makes you smarter than you were the day before? You know, I used to, I had a friend at NYU. I used to go down and meet him in Washington Square Park. And a uh, guy's name you could maybe know was named Jim Kars. Uh, wrote lots of good books. He was a distinguished professor of this and that. And we would talk for an hour for lunch. And I always, walking back, I'd always think, wow, I was about twice as smart as usual in that conversation. They were happy every time. So it's really nice, like, you know, don't get so too smart that you can't say anything. Just that much more. So anyway, they both experienced each other as for the geniuses uh, that they were. It was this really great thing. Then they continued the correspondence. But after, I don't know where to put it, like after two or three years, um, it, uh, pro these problems began to surface. Then they, 2000, uh, 1909, they sailed together to Clark University, which is not one of those major universities at this time, but in 19, in, um, uh, in the early 20th century, it was. In any case, there was a very distinguished psychology department, and they invited a whole group of people, including Jung and Freud, on the boat together, coming over, right? And they analyzed their dreams, and Jung's account is not so flattering to Freud about how he, Freud told Jung a dream, and then Jung interpreted it, and then oh, uh, Freud kind of fainted, or he kind of lost his consciousness. Another time, a young analyzed a dream and Freud urinated in his pants. It doesn't say what Freud was thinking, it doesn't say, it just gives Jung's account. But it couldn't have been helpful for their relationship. Uh, uh, well, either one, actually, in a way, but it was terribly painful. Well, very proud. Um, and, um, uh, you know, Freud. And it was a very disadvantageous life for his genius, whereas Jung 
really was privileged, really privileged. I mean, it's just an inestimable difference to be um, Christian and, well, sort of Christian, son of a, of a, of a pastor will get you, you know, Christian enough when that's advantageous. And compared to uh, a Freud, a Jew, in the 20th century, that becomes this rapidly, fiercely, horrendously anti-Semitic century. Um, uh, okay, so um, then uh, this is now in the teen years. Oh, I'm sorry, I should finish them off. So then these, you, you can, I almost sort of quoted the letters already where he says, don't, don't disappear, and I need you for my dogma, and Jung says, no, I'm not signing on to any dogma, and etc. I don't want your mantle, and I'm doing my own work. And then he writes um, Symbols of Transformation uh, in 13, uh, which is the end, uh, which gives a very positive rendering of myths and symbols from a religious point of view. And Freud, like Marx, both Jewish, both brilliant, both really liberating the West from uh, sort of late medieval thinking and culture. Uh, one destroys the illusion that economics and class is, um, is shall we say, okay. You know, that is benign and not controlled by a few people for their own benefit. Uh, I mean, Marx just does that irrefutably. It's, you can't get back past that as though it didn't happen. It happened and it's still true. And so Marx really did that. And Freud did something equally amazing. What, he, what Marx did for economics and class, Freud did for uh, the unconscious and the whole area of integrity. The whole area of really integrity. Huge contributions. So if you don't, if you're not, you know, on first name basis with Marx and Freud, in a certain sense, I, I want to say you might be a little bit innocent. I mean, this this is grown up thinking. This is telling the truth about the human condition. There may be recovery from it, but you have to go through it first. You have to go through Marx and and uh, Freud uh, to then begin to think what would count as a solution. Because if the solution doesn't take account of the fact that a few people control the lives of millions of, of you know, you know, 95% of the people, this is before 1% after all, um, uh, uh, and you don't understand the, the reality of the, the power of the unconscious to control a conscious life, then, you know, you kind of have to go back and start again, because those are just huge, and uh, etc. And both both atheistic uh, Jews in uh, Christian culture. Marx basically wrote the 20th century in, a, in the British Museum. Uh, barely, he and his family barely surviving. Well, he's spending 12 hours a day in that museum, you know, writing and writing and analyzing and, and researching. And if you go to, a museum, go to a library and you see some old guy, you know, kind of scruffy and maybe needing a shower, careful, he may, he may be, or she may be writing the uh, 22nd century, you know, you know, it's hard to know for sure. Um, now, uh, Freud didn't have that problem. He, he was um, uh, affluent uh, from his practice and books, etc. Uh, but he still had it hard in that culture. And Jung, by comparison, uh, married a person totally devoted to him, uh, brought tremendous wealth, and, and he's a, he was a, early on he was a, a, a recognized as a brilliant uh, and learned original psychiatrist. Okay, um, so, so, so. Um, and pretty, pretty early he gets into the, the uh, research on the mandala, and uh, I'm not going to ask you uh, if you know about the mandala, because I'm hoping you all do, and I'd like to go get, I'd like to sustain that belief. Uh, you should know the mandala, which is uh, a, uh, it really is primarily Asian, but you can find it in other cultures, as Jung did, but it really is, it has the home base uh, in Asia, and Jung was the first one 
I think, uh, to uh, uh, say what is powerful about it. I mean, we just look at it, all right, and it's, it's beautiful because it has an exquisite play of the triangularity, square and circle, and it leads us always to the center. All right? Now, our uh, symbol of CIS is the Sri Yantra, but it is not a mandala, I don't think. That's a good question. I should ask Jim Ryan what he thinks of that. Uh, but we do, we have several times there have been somebody who take over publicity and next, you know, letterheads and, and websites and stuff would come out without the symbol. And somebody would say, by the way, where's the symbol? Symbol reinstated. It's important. It's important. Uh, I don't know if it's a mandala. Anyway, um, if you're interested, we can do something second half. The mandala are these. Uh, 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 it's a very beautiful thing if you ever get this chance to see <coughs> the Tibetan monks make a mandala with by scraping um, these a little like Col a colored sand. Sorry, colored, colored sand. sand into these exquisite shapes. Uh, and the, of course, it, making it is itself a, a spiritual, meditative spiritual activity. But when it's done, when you behold it, you have this wonderful experience of coherence, of harmony, and centrality. So it does, it brings the, these optical images. No, shapes, figures, triangularity, um, square, and circularity. Uh, it doesn't have to have all three. It can have two, often has three, and they're all different. There's a very good book on mandala by Giuseppe Tucci, T-U-C-C-I. It's just called Mandala. It's a little book. Um, I read it a long, long time ago, but it's still in my head. It's a very, very vivid um, book. Uh, so the mandala. So Jung now is setting out really to find uh, to find images that are in the culture, in any culture, providing psychological health. He's looking for where are the symbols that are holding the people together or enabling them to get along, be creative, etc. And he says he looks then out of the way places because those cultures have not been overrun by a flattening rationality. <clears throat> so one of the great things about Jung is that he critiques the very commitment to rationality that the West thinks is its great contribution. And Jung says it has made a great contribution and it will continue to do so, but at the expense of the interior, the symbolic, the unconscious, nurturing of certain symbols and, and images, one of them being uh, the mandala. Um, OK, then um, uh, he studies uh, uh, alchemy, which is a whole process of transformation, and it's very, very complicated. I don't know that I can do it justice, even though I have read it and thought about it. Um, and maybe I could if you asked. And if you don't ask, maybe I'll be just as glad. Um, uh, it, and no, it's not because I haven't studied it. It's just very mysterious. Really, it's complicated. I don't know. It's, um, I've read different accounts that don't seem to have much in common. So now, I said before it was 1913. Then we needed symbols of transformation. I see my notes. It's 1912, and that was the end of the relationship to Freud. And now there's really two world-class psychiatrists working on the unconscious. Uh, Freud, who continues, who lives until 1939, uh, but the last 10 years he was not well and really very depressed and uh, like many um, the wide awake Jewish people could see the wave of anti-Semitism that was uh, about really to take over, take over Europe. Uh, and he, um, he, then, he died in London in 1939, uh, the same year as Yates. <coughs> uh, <coughs> okay. And the beginning of the war. Uh, so um, I should I guess I should be conscious of the time. Um, let me introduce synchronicity. Um, you you should know that uh, Rick is a is an expert on synchronicity. He often gives 
lectures and workshop, I don't know about workshops, lectures certainly, and, and uh, Cosmos and Psyche is an excellent discussion on, if you don't have that book, if you don't have these two books, you really should, I and mean, treat yourself, because they're, they're, they're huge in this, uh, in this department, both of those books, the, the History of Western Thought, uh, which, uh, which has an appendix, which I could tell you about, it's extremely interesting, uh, that basically uh, sort of tips his hand that his reading of Western intellectual history is a Jungian octuple reading, right? Um, and then in the Cosmos and Psyche, there's also an excellent, uh, no, not also, there is an excellent discussion of synchronicity. Let me tell you this, and then we will uh, break. Um, so, um, <clears throat> I'm inclined to say, or ask, is reality really like this? That you, in an unsuspecting state of mind, would observe a, an astonishing coincidence that is highly implausible, that you would see exactly the exact same image or phrase, uh, picture, story, event from totally separate parts of your life and separate parts of the culture, just back to back in a way that you couldn't miss <clears throat> noticing this is weird. All right. Now, if you're like the non Jungian mainstream culture, you say, that was fun. <laughs> that was a really interesting coincidence. That was really unlikely. Isn't that great? <laughs> but if you are a Jungian and you're working with this, as I hope you do or will, then you say, what is the universe? That is, what is psyche? What is the unconscious where there's a lot of wisdom? What is it telling me to notice? Now, you can go a little nuts up and start thinking every time you see the same ad on the, because, yeah, I know, they're on all the buses, okay? So it's not <laughs> necessarily a synchronicity. It's just that you ride the same lane, okay? And Holy Names University bought the side of the bus or the Academy of Science or whatever. Okay, so not everything coincidental or interesting or repetitive is synchronicity. But they are some that are almost unbelievable. That's when you say, what does that mean? And the idea that Jung developed brilliantly, and then subsequently in conversation with the, uh, with the physicist Pauli about could the universe be doing this from a sort of scientific point of view, I haven't found that so, so helpful or convincing because empirically, it seems to me, the fact of synchronicity is overwhelming. We have those experiences. It's just a matter of now getting an explanation. For Jung's explanation, which is the best I've been able to find, and I was really glad when I found it, uh, which was not the first thing I found out about when I started reading Jung a long time ago. Um, and I, since finding out about it, I've you know, learned more from, from uh, Rick about it. Sean, too. Um, but Rick is really on top of this research. So I'm saying, well, I know Sean as well. Uh, they're both really, they both see, and, and I agree with them. Uh, though they saw it before me, that if synchronicity is true, the universe is really different from what the mainstream thinks. It is a wedge. It breaks into the mainstream view that there's nothing out there, there's nothing in there, down there, that is smarter than we are. There is. No. First off, there's nothing there. And secondly, it's not only there, but it's wise, and I don't know if we say it's compassionate. There's a whole problem about whether uh, synchronicities are positive, necessarily positive. When you consider something we haven't yet talked about, but we will, for Jung, the whole uh, higher, deeper dimension is both positive and negative. 
all the way to God, there is evil. So synchronicity has to be tricky as well. But I don't ever read about that. I don't think people really think of it as, as the wise universe helping us out with a little pssst. Yeah. Um, Stan Groff has a really good story about the negative synchronicity event that uh, he wrote about in, um, was it When Strange Things Happen? I think the Impossible. The Impossible Things Happen. Great book. It's a really good story about how he, how he came to marry his first wife, I think. Yeah. Uh, this, oh, is, this is Stan himself. Y yeah. Okay. He wrote this. Anyway, so if, you know, you get that book. When it's the, in there. When the Impossible Happened. When the Impossible, when the impossible yeah. Happened. It is a totally, more than enjoyable. It's a thrilling book. Mm. And, you know, it, like I just said, could, the, could reality, or be, could the universe be like this? To go the next level is that book. And you have I mean, almost, after every one of these incidents, you say, could reality be like that? Mm. And, you know, because the whole book is to say, yes, it is. Mm. It's really, it's a great fun read. Yeah, I'm not real old Stan, but that one is really in my head. Yeah. And then there's the story of the, of the where, where, where are we coming from? Oh, yeah, Ken. Jung, Jung talks about the golden uh, scarab. Yeah, yes, golden, that's the classic one. And that's in Cosmos and Psyche. Right, yeah. I, th I think we should break. And are, we, are we okay? Are you going to leave the table like this? You can hear and see. I can, you're speaking up, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, Isabella, is that window closed? Yep. It's